Welcome to Ethics Matter. I'm Stephanie Sai, and I'm joined by Krista Tippett, the host of the award-winning public radio program On Being. It's also a podcast, and in that program, she talks to people of faith and also in the secular spheres of science and activism. Her most recent book is called Becoming Wise. Krista, thank you so much for mm, joining us. I'm so glad to be here. So let's start with the title, Becoming Wise. Kind of an ambitious title. <laughs> yes. um, is it a self-help book in certain ways? Uh, I, I don't think of it that way. And actually, you know, one thing I have to point out is the becoming word is just as important as the wise word. I'm not describing a destination. I'm describing a process. Um, I actually did not name the book until close to the end. I started out pursuing a question that's come at me a lot across the years. People have said, you know, you've interviewed all these wise, graceful lives, these, these, these voices. Um, what are, what are, the, are there recurring qualities or recurring themes? And that's what I started tracing. In the end, I, I realized that that notion of becoming wise, um, and becoming wise through the ordinary elements of any life, um, was really the, the, the connective tissue of the book. And it became more, more and more important to me as I gleaned these lessons that this is not, of course, there are, there are these spiritual geniuses, there are these saintly figures, these wise sages you know, of history who all come to mind. But, but that wisdom is something that, that is accessible to all of us with whatever the raw materials of our lives are. And, and I think to, um, to help people take that seriously. I love this line in, in the book, sort of tools for the art of living, if you will. Um, I've come to think of virtues and rituals as spiritual technologies mm -hmm. for being our best selves in flesh and blood, time and space. Talk about the use of that word technology. Spiritual technologies. Yeah. I'm so fascinated by how we we, we talk a lot and, and are very imaginative in the way we talk about, in fact, our technologies growing intelligent and growing sentient and the growing smart conscious. Phone, yeah. Yes. We possess intelligence. We possess consciousness. And we have this capacity as human beings to take this further step to become wise, um, which leavens intelligence. Uh, and I think has an ability to advance evolution to in the direction we want it to go. Um, I, I really do think that these tools and techniques, you know, um, rituals, uh, which I think you know physically we need, um, and virtues, which in fact are practices. Um, and, and, you know, neuroscience is now giving new language to something that our spiritual traditions have carried forward in time, this, this intelligence that what we practice, we become. And that goes as much for becoming more patient, more loving, more compassionate, uh, more generous, more wise. I want to break, break that down a little bit because yeah. science is important to you. You interview it's a really, lot of yes. scientists yes. on on being. Is that because, you know, uh, do you ever get accused of sort of being too fluffy? You know, and, and is science and sort of neuroplasticity and the studies around how physically you're impacted by these practices. Yes. Is that important to you from a, uh, you're a journalist. Is that is that important to you to be able to speak to people in scientific terms? I think that in the 21st century, scientists, physicists, evolutionary biologists, neuroscientists are walking some of the territory that philosophers and theologians walked in previous centuries. I mean, whether they are religious or not, whether their inquiry is explicitly spiritual or not, they are yielding this amazing new insight into these ancient questions, what it means to be human, how we want to live. Scientists are taking, you know, virtues. They're taking notions like altruism and empathy and mindful attention into the laboratory. What are um, they finding? Well, they're, they're kind of unlocking um, 
you know, some of these virtues, some of these practices and, and these pieces of intelligence, these, these tools for the arts of living that have been carried forward across millennia by our spiritual traditions, they're, they are learning that these things actually do change people, you know, on a physiological basis. And the, the science of neuroplasticity, which I think is one of the most wonderful and emboldening discoveries of, of our generation that, you know, that our brains and characters don't stop forming at a certain point. You know, that I think when I was growing up, you thought it's young adulthood, you know, or in, in the teenage years. But we, we've now found that, that our brains and our characters can continue to evolve across the lifespan and that we can influence that with our behaviors. And that discovery was made, was, was deeply influenced by the work of Richard Davidson at Madison at the Brain Imaging Laboratory, who was approached in the 1990s by the Dalai Lama, who said to him, who has a great reverence for science, who said, I believe that these contemplative practices that we, that my community engages in on this, you know, in, that, we, that we weave into ordinary life, that they change us, and I want you to test that. And that, love, that was, yeah. Love, compassion, forgiveness, some of the sort of tools yeah. for living. I mean, is what you're really saying that sort of being kind can actually make us healthier, can make us, can make that our bodies is, stronger. That is one of the things we're finding. That, um, for example, there's some amazing uh, research about gratitude. Very simple practices of gratitude. You know, this has been studied by clinical psychologists. Having people once a day or once a week make a list of things they were grateful for, even on the bad days that it actually affects their health, uh, that they sleep better, right? That they feel a sense of inner peace. Um, so yes, there are, there are actually physiological health benefits, and, and there's a quality of life benefit that people report, which is harder to measure in a laboratory, but, but, but is real. I want to take a step back and just go back to how you started on being. Um, you started out as a journalist, then you went to divinity school. How did mm -hmm. one lead to the other? I mean, w was journalism unsatisfying to you in any way? Were you searching for something else? I really loved journalism. I started as a print journalist, and um, I loved it, and it's an amazing foundation for everything I've done since. Um, I, I didn't so much enjoy the, the breaking news aspect of things because I I felt like as soon as I was digging into something I had to turn my attention to something else. We call that feeding the beast <laughs> okay, in the feeding business. The beast. Yes. Um, I was also I was in divided Berlin, which was an amazing place. I was just kind of on the fault line of what seemed to be the great crisis, you know, threatening mankind at that point. Um, I had an experience at a very young age. I was I was thoroughly political. I was not religious at all in those years. I was was not you know, would, would not have used the word spirituality, probably. Um, but I had an experience of being up very close to people who were literally moving those missiles around on a map of Europe. I was really in those circles of, so I went from journalism to being a diplomatic appointee. Skip that step. And um, seeing a great disconnect, a chasm between um, the genuine power people were exercising in the world, and I, I felt the incredible moral responsibility that they had. And kind of people who had great big outer lives and impoverished inner lives. Mm. So they're doing important work at a public level, and they're not, the imprint they're making on the world around them is not necessarily gener generative or creative or positive. So I was confused by that. I also you know, Berlin, people don't talk about divided Berlin in this way often, but among other things, it was a vast social experiment. You had one people, one city, one language, one culture, divided into two worldviews. Um, people were living in dramatically contrasting circumstances, economic and social circumstances. Their range of choice was dramatically different. But I saw there, because I loved people on both sides of that wall, and I also made this observation that is kind of a you know, classic observation, but made it on a, on a personal level that people could have empty lives, people could create lives of dignity and beauty, um, and it was not dependent on the circumstances they were working with. Hmm. It's, it's how they worked with those raw materials. 
And, and that led me kind of reluctantly to start asking what I finally called spiritual questions, um, wanting to work at that human level of change and, 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 and where people make meaning. You said that you were not spiritual, though, at that time. So that was actually a personal journey for you. You it were was. asking yourself those yes. questions. Yes, because I'd only been asking political questions. And I then started, as I said, I started asking spiritual questions. Uh, but I only called them that after a while. And then, uh, because I had grown up in a, an immersive religious world, but where the life of the mind was, was not honored, you know, the life of the mind was kind of held at bay, I went to study theology because I needed to know that this could have intellectual content as well as spiritual content. Um, I also needed to know that, um, that working in this sphere taking it seriously, this sphere, what we call religion and spirituality, could in fact address the complexity of the world I'd experienced. And you know, I found theology to be thrilling, you know, just a thrilling discipline and an incredible intellectual heft. But then I came out of that in the mid-90s into this American landscape where it was, in, it was a moment of incredible toxicity of you know, a very few strident religious voices defining religion in American public life. And I have to say, being handed the microphone by journalists because you know, figures like Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, they were the very moral entertaining. Majority. Yes, the moral majority, the Christian coalition. They did uh, sound bites, which was kind of a new invention then, really well. Um, Yes. They got a lot of traction at that time. I want to get into all of that, but I want to go back to those days in divided Germany mm -hmm. because um, you talk about that disconnect between sort of spirituality and maybe humanity and maybe even ethics um, and real politic because that's what yes. you're really talking about when you talked about that, that time in the Cold War. You're talking about real politic. Um, why does there have to be such a separation? Um, you know, even leaders that say they are practicing Christians. Um, seem to sort of have this divide between policy and the way they behave in the world, these major players, and their inner life. It yeah. Is part of what Krista Tippett is doing, trying to bridge that, find a way to integrate those lives? Yeah, so I think we, I, I, I'm all about reality and being reality-based. And the reality of policy and politics at those highest levels is that there are no cho very, very few choices where you really have a clear-cut, simple choice between something that's good and something that's evil. True. Something that's moral or something that's immoral. At that level of complexity, it, it doesn't work that way. Having said that, I, I think that, you know, I was born in 1960, and I think that part of the story of the latter half of the 20th century is that we thought we could kind of retire this irrational, spiritual, values-driven part of life. We had this, you know, this is this was kind of our culture. We had this culture. We, you know, we'd won the war. The economy was booming. We believed in our systems. Uh, we, you know, it was a, it was a it was a uh, century of ideologies. And we believed in facts to be able to tell us the truth and drive the truth. And in the 60s also, this country experienced genuine diversity, really, for the very first time. The, you know, for the first time, non-European immigrants began to come into, you know, we, the laws were changed. Of course, America had been racially diverse before then, but the 60s was the first time we really integrated yeah. that into our sense of self. And also there was all this um, eruption of new ideas, of, of social freedom and of intellectual freedom that was new, cultural freedom. Part of the way we navigated that was with this virtue of tolerance, which is about kind of letting you be you and I'll be me. And part of the way, and it was a good impulse. I mean, you know, one of the things I believe very deeply now is that we've, we've tolerance has outlived its usefulness as our only civic virtue. Like that you say it's in your book that that's, yeah, that that's kind of a low bar. It's a low Actually, bar. Can we, can we go further right. than tolerance? And it, but it was a way of, it was a way of creating control and, and keeping the peace and navigating something that was very new. Um, 
but one of the ways we did that was to create, you know, what we call values-free spaces. And you, you know, you of course you could have deep convictions, but you checked them at the door of your workplaces, of your professional life, of politics, of school. And there were reasons for that, but I, I, I think one, I don't think it was, a, I don't think it was sustainable, and I think it did have the effect of, uh, of. You know, of training all of us to actually go into public life, into our common life, without our moral grounding. We, and we, we haven't learned to flex those muscles. So it's no wonder to me that people, um, not just in those highest places of policy or those large public lives, um, aren't very skilled um, or experienced at bringing their sources of moral discernment into that realm of decision making. So assuming that one day they do, uh, do you run into the problem of sort of the moral majority and, and values clashing? Yeah. Is, is that part of what Well, that's, and so that's the scary model we got in the late 20th century <laughs> yeah. that made it seem all the more right that we should keep this out. I like to pose this thought experiment. What if when um, Christian voices Orthodox conservative Christian voices reasserted themselves into American political life, uh, which was after a, a, a will, a chosen silence, and a kind of there had been a kind of withdrawal in the early 20th century. What if, when that happened, what they had done, the effect of that, would be not to uh, just to bring certain positions uh, into play, but to model the deepest virtues of Christianity? What if? What if the result of that had been that we would all have seen robustly modeled what love of enemies could look like in politics, in real policy situations? What if it had become a great experiment in that? If it were about joining the deepest virtues and behaviors uh, with the thinking, with the positioning, um, I don't think we would be wringing our hands about, you know, needing to keep religion, keep, keep places free um, of religious and moral thinking. I, I, I think we could do this completely differently. So it's how we live and not how we talk. And, it, and, and, and how we, what we believe and how we live are in a creative tension, because it is going to be a tension, but that, that what always prevails, which in fact is what actually always prevails at the heart of our religious and ethical traditions, is how we treat others. Do you believe in moral relativism, or do you think that there are just sort of hard and fast moral, you know, mottos like "Do unto others as you would have them do unto you," the golden rule. You know, I was raised with that from third grade on, and not much religion. Are we at a point where there's not even that in this society? So, I I don't like moral relativism. I don't I I. I think the real challenge um, and really the kind of calling that, that can take us, take us to wisdom rather than just intelligence is to figure out, and we do have to figure this out because this hasn't been what we've been trying to do, is to figure out in this century how we can, how we can bring deep convictions and deep passions into our public spaces and join that with a commitment to stay in relationship uh, with the people with whom we disagree. There are some instincts we've developed over a long period of time that work against that. So now there's such a breakdown that we realize you know, we have to change. Like one of the instincts is, first of all, we, you know, we deal in this culture in competing certainties. We, we take most seriously because we turn everything into an either or, we set up a debate, we set up an argument, um, and we, we hand that argument over to the most strident voices who have absolutely no questions left alongside their certainties. Yeah. And we also have assumptions that the goal of a conversation or a debate or a dialogue is for someone to win, or, or it gets called, you know, you move on, or you take a vote, or you move on. Uh, these are these are these are ways to be in dialogue, but they're not 
and, and, and there are hard things we have to discuss on which we're going to disagree, but there needs to be the parallel, simultaneous work of creating new realities, of walking towards the generative common life, which includes, in the 21st century, like never before, uh, the necessity that we are in relationship, uh, that we are creating common life with very different others who, who we will not agree with, that the point can't be agreeing. There has to be value um, if we are committed to common life. You know, common ground is not the same thing as common life. And that we have to really create this new muscle memory. Yeah. And, it, it, and you know, moral relativism to me is, 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 you know, maybe it's dangerous, it's boring too. I don't think it's good for us. So I think somehow we have to learn how to bring our convictions, bring our passions, um, into common life, it sounds like and and juggle and not juggle, but and combine that with a right. commitment to common life. It sounds like you're almost sort of the anti-fundamentalist. <laughs> well, I, I take that label. Yeah, um, I mean that's a compliment. If you ever went back to journalism, how do you think you would approach it differently? If you went back <laughs> to covering, you know, big news, new geopolitical, news. historical I don't know. issues. Well. Uh, I, you know, I'm critical of um, the the fact that traditional journalism, especially news journalism, that we have all this sophistication about covering and analyzing what is catastrophic, corrupt, and failing. I don't say that to criticize that sophistication, but what we but we do not bring a comparable sophistication to covering what is good and redemptive and you know hope as a muscular reasonable you know option. orientation yeah. option yeah. choice um i also i say that and i know how hard it is to make goodness as riveting as evil yeah and that, and I think that goes back to like how we are, you know, what our brains do. Like we are drawn to, we're looking for the threat because we're ready to mobilize. So I, and, and so I, so when you ask me the question, like I don't have a prescription, I don't know what I would do differently, but what I would, what I would, what I would endeavor to figure out, and, and there are a lot of people experimenting with this. I would endeavor to figure out how can we cover goodness? Uh, what's working, you know? the new realities that are being incubated that better describe the world we want our, to live in, the world we want our children to in, 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 inhabit. Um, how could we cover that in, in, with as much uh, sophistication, as much dedication? And again, in ways that, would it, so because you know, the, the feel good fluffy sidebar piece of the saintly person who yeah. you know, makes you feel good but you could never be like them. And it's also like too much of that would be boring. Yeah. So I'm not talking about being boring. And I don't have the answer, but I think that that's a good challenge to say. Do you feel like ourselves. you saved yourself when you left the business? Uh, I mean, we're a pretty <sighs> cynical bunch, us journalists. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like, I, I had a conversation with a journalist um, a few years ago he said, who said, you know, journalism, journalism could be a healing art. And I, I, I think, I, I think much, le much like, um, physicians, you know, people go into medicine to be healers, and then they end up being fixers, and they end up um, uh, focusing on pathology, <laughs> right? And there's kind of an analogy with journalism. I actually do think people go into journalism because they want to be a good force in the world. Because did you realize, they believe in the power of information, right? When you took that step back to look at your inner life, did you mm -hmm. did it occur to you that sort of all the conflict we see in the world is actually sort of just a mirror of the dark and the light in our inner lives? Played out on a world stage in a massive way? I I guess that's um, I think that's more an insight I've grown into. I think I was trying to understand back then in divided Berlin, you know, it, it didn't make sense to me that, um, that we don't always um, do what's best for us and that we don't always, that we, that we often act in ways that work against our, our own 
deepest longings and the needs of others. But I think that's one way theology is an important discipline in our midst because theology is the discipline that analyzes that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's but, but, but again, I, I, do, I do think there's a way in which we have tools now and, and there's a, I especially think the new generations coming up um, are insisting, you know, some of the language they brought into our, into our vocabulary about, you know, like authenticity, transparency, integrity, you know, like all words, these words can get overused and they can get fragile. Um, but, but in those words, I, I see this generation saying, you know, we are going to be the same people on the inside and the outside. They've seen the kind of hypocrisy of our institutions. They've seen the loneliness in the lives of adults that is engendered by that disconnect. Um, so, so I do think we have a chance. And so when I, when I talk about becoming wise, I, for me, I, I'm not interested in that just as a private move. I, I think it's a move we can make together. Um, and it's gonna, it's gonna need us to work individually, but it also needs us to do is this very un-American thing and acknowledge our need of each other, to accompany each other, to create something called common life for this century, which is not going to look like common life in the last century. It is a very hopeful note to end this on. Krista Tippett, thank you so much. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.